so far. Coming up now, we've got Jennifer Wilkins, who's going to be hosting a panel discussion surrounding degrowth, uh, which is, I think, a really important uh, conversation for us to have. So um, welcome, Jennifer, and I'm going to hand over to you to introduce the panelists and the topic. Hi, thank you, Pete. Um, yeah, hi, and welcome everyone who's um, coming now into this conversation um, about transitioning big business toward a post-growth world. Um, my name is Jennifer Wilkins. I'm a degrowth business advisor and an advocate for um, post-growth business conversations. And I have with me today two people who are pretty much at the helm globally of post-growth thinking. Um, first of all, let me introduce uh, Dr. Donnie McClurkin, who uh, Donnie is a social entrepreneur and um, co-author of an upcoming book um, yet to be published. Um, I believe it's called How on Earth Flourishing in a Not-for-Profit World. And Donnie is the executive director of the Post-Growth Institute, which is an international uh, not-for-profit, which is working to enable collective well-being within ecological limits. I also have with me today Dr. Catherine Trebek. Um, Catherine is a political economist and a writer, and she's very well known as the co-founder of the Wellbeing Economy Alliance, um, which has been an important foundation to New Zealand's declaration to become a wellbeing economy. Now, Catherine is a fellow of many institutes, including the Zoe Institute, the Post Growth Institute, the Schumacher Institute, and a member of the Club of Rome. So two very storied guests in the sustainability world and uh, with expertise in post-growth thinking. Now, the reason we're having this conversation is because our current economic system is growth reliant, uh, but much empirical evidence shows that despite a huge amount of effort going into sustainability, growth cannot be sufficiently decoupled from environmental degradation, at least not in time before we may hit some really horrific tipping points. So we must therefore move away from growth as an economic goal and develop a post-growth economy, which is focused instead on delivering well-being while operating within ecological limits. And we talk so much in the post-growth space about um, startups and small and medium enter uh, medium-sized enterprises that are agile enough to begin to show us the way forward toward a post-growth orientation. But a much more challenging question is how existing large um, um, multinational enterprises, for instance, can actually reposition and reframe themselves to succeed in a future post-growth economy. Now we're a couple of minutes already into our 45 minutes. So very quickly, just to set up this conversation, uh, what we're going to cover today is we're going to quickly describe the emerging post-growth vision. We're going to um, roughly perhaps describe some of the elements that might underpin a kind of a post-growth theory of change for larger businesses. And then we'll maybe touch on how to um, think about activating post-growth thinking in some of these larger organizations. So um, for those in our audience who aren't uh, quite sure what we mean by post-growth thinking, I think we'll start by exploring that. And um, if I can put the question to you first, Catherine, um, in your work in the post-growth field, you're probably having a lot of conversations and doing a lot of thinking yourself. What do you believe is the emerging vision of a post-growth world? Thanks, Please. Jennifer, and thanks to also to Stephen and everyone involved in the conference. Really great to be here. Um, I'm standing on Ngunnawal and Ngambri country in Canberra in Australia. So we want to acknowledge um, elders and all their care for the country and really appreciate their ongoing work to protect our precious planetary home. So yeah, in, term, in terms of the of what's what's emerging, I mean, I think we're not short of evidence that business as usual is no longer cutting the, cutting the mustard. Um, we're seeing that it's not delivering for enough people um, in countries like New Zealand and in Australia, and it's also putting huge pressure on on Mother Nature. So I think there is this sort of growing awareness and recognition that we need to look at different ways to ensure good lives for everyone on a healthy planet and and that comes with the recognition too that the recipes that you know policy makers and business people and entrepreneurs and communities and, and you know leaders have reached for in the past 
um, are not okay anymore because we're in different times now. And so we can't just reach for those old recipes and press repeat uh, yes. because we're, you're in, they haven't worked sufficiently and because of the times we're in, you know, given the extent of planetary breakdown. And the, the good news is that there are lots and lots of folk around the world in corridors of power, around boardroom tables, around, you know, community spaces who are rolling up their sleeves and exploring how to start to change and transform the economy so that it's very much more deliberately in line with delivering what people and planet need. So not sort of, as you said previously, you know, focusing on growing the economy and keeping our fingers crossed that that will trickle down to benefits for enough people and keeping our fingers crossed that that will you know, not push Mother Nature beyond what she can handle because we've seen it's not happening. So a lot of folks, whether it's in government, who are broadening out their goals and starting to support things like um, the sort of renewable sectors or pre-distribution and encourage the sort of activities we need more of, um, lots of enterprises too that we're, we're going to talk about later too who are really recognising that they have a role in being part of the positive solution. And of course, communities around the world too are starting to demonstrate what this looks like. So I think the good news is that this isn't a step into the unknown now. We see chinks of light of what this looks like. I think the challenge and why this panel is really really appropriate and really timely is that we need to start joining that up and making that change happen at scale. So. Thanks for that, Catherine. That's um, sort of quite a complex picture emerging then of some of the transition um, aspects that are taking place. Um, perhaps the end vision is quite not as clear right now, but certainly people are beginning to make forays into how the change might begin to happen. Um, Donny, if I could turn to you and ask you from your point of view, how are you picturing the post-growth world? Thanks, Jennifer. What's really exciting to me is that I've been conducting an experiment for about nine years now, uh, all around the world, uh, with people across all sorts of demographics. I've conducted this experiment with Fortune 500 executives, with people living on the streets, people who identify as free market uh, ideology, or others who are uh, self-identifying as, as anarchists. And it doesn't matter who I conduct this experiment with, um, the results are always the same. And the experiment is asking people what it would feel like, not what they envisage uh, necessarily. First, we start with what would you imagine a post-growth world looks like, an economy that's working for people and planet. But then we ask them, what does it feel like? And we then ask them to draw a symbol or a shape that represents how it feels in that economy that's working for everyone and everything. And once they've done that, we then ask them to draw what it feels like in the present economy. And what's fascinating, I'd like to show the results here of what happens because it speaks to some underlying principles. And you can just imagine yourself drawing for a moment what that would feel like in that future that's working versus the present. Here's what happens. So we see that for the present, for the future economy, people typically draw either a circle, an infinity or panarchy symbol, a spiral or a heart, or a close combination or variation of those. And then for the present, people typically draw a jagged line, a triangle, an isosceles triangle, a downward arrow, or a mess of lines. And this takes us to, when you ask this question of what, what do we envisage for a post-growth future? It's an economy where if you look at the difference here, we have the top row being non-linear and the bottom row is very linear. In other words, even the most growth-obsessed capitalistic individual in this world knows that deep down we have to move from something that's linear to a non-linear system. And for us at the Post Growth Institute, that's talking about what is it that's not circulating in our present economy? Yes, there's the big emphasis on the circular economy as it relates to the material throughput, uh, to waste, to these sorts of things. But underneath those are other forms of things that aren't circulating, power and money. So for us, a post-growth vision is one in which the circulation of money, power, and resources are inherent in the design of the economy. And that brings us to things we're going to address later around ownership, around governance, uh, and around uh, material use. I think that gives people some very different ways to think about what post-growth might mean. It's not just about, you know, the circularity. It's about these other issues you've um, talked about, the power, the money, and the resources themselves. 
So um, the question is then, you know, that the topic of this conversation is really about large business. Now, large businesses tend to believe that they are very resilient and can absorb a lot of shocks and um, really do set, um, you know, the direction for the economy. Why should large businesses be taking um, post-growth uh, post growthism seriously as a potential future context? Catherine, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, just, I mean, just a couple of bullet points almost. I mean, partly because they're already seeing huge disruption because of planetary break breakdown in their supply chains and how that's feeding into the prices that they're facing. And, you know, if nothing else, their insurance costs, you know, we're really seeing the insurance industry really document the impact of environmental challenges on the operating costs. Um, so there's a very sort of inward focused um, question there, but also we're seeing a lot of companies reporting that that's increasingly hard to hire qualified staff who are saying to, to businesses, we want to see the values that we have replicated in the business that we're working with and, and customers as well. Um, but also I don't think there's a, a, there's a sort of huge firewall between people working in businesses and then who they are as citizens and humans as well. And so of course, you know, people working in business will be looking at the challenges facing the world today. They'll be feeling them. They'll be seeing on their TV screens or, you know, watch, watching their own homes become threatened. I mean, here in Australia, we've got peak summer type fire season today in the, you know, the beginning of the middle of, of spring. And so, you know, business people will be seeing that as, as well. And I don't think they you know they they are different people when they walk into their businesses they face different governance systems and different processes and different incentives but i don't think they can completely park what they see around them as as citizens and i just want to say on the the flip side why why does um the sort of the new economy movement and I guess humanity writ, writ large really need to see large scale businesses being part of this conversation it's because as i said earlier we, we need the, to go beyond small scale change. Um, as you outlined in your opening remarks, Jennifer, yeah, there's lots of discussion, incredible innovation happening amongst a small scale startup. And that's okay, because often, you know, innovation does happen at the margins, at the end of the bell curve. That's so often where cool stuff happens, but with that we can't have it stay there. So we do need to scale this up and replicate it and encourage it to become the, the norm, the new norm, we need to, um, and that does require that bigger businesses, bigger companies are part of the, these conversations because the challenges are massive. We can't leave them, leave them out of this. Mm. So reflecting what you've just said, uh, you're basically saying that um, employees may be some of the first people to start to overcome some of these structural barriers and they're going to push those barriers down from perhaps inside these organizations. And that's, that's good. They're, they're absolutely, they're part of it, but I don't think employees on their own. I mean, and Donnie's already mentioned this, you know, ownership structures, governance structures, you know, where power lies within organisations and often employees are not particularly powerful, depending on the organisational structure. Um, in some cases they are, and that, you know, they're the sort of business models we might want to in inculcate. Uh, but, but yeah, definitely employees are a really important driver of this. Awesome. And, and Donny, what reflections are you sort of having on, on why large businesses will, will have a role and uh, should be taking this seriously in their future? Building on what Catherine shared there about market dynamics, if your business model is based on an extraction of money from the real economy through shareholder returns, if your business model is based on having power over people in terms of governance uh, and decision-making internally within your company. If your business model is based on taking things to market in ways that are not relational, as in you don't use iterative design to actually test what people want, and you think you can just keep pushing a product without understanding the changing landscape of consumer uh, or citizen uh, desires, you're simply going to get out-competed in this emerging economy. Things are changing. The, the competitiveness of certain business models is moving faster than I've ever seen before. I've been looking at this kind of market analysis for a long time, and it's just harder and harder to compete, especially as a big company, if you are not keeping up with things that actually centre a different approach to the way that you do ownership and, and what happens with money circulation. If you don't look at what happens with power and how you're governing, and if you don't look at how you're actually engaging uh, with 
across that boundary between consumers or citizens and, and the business and actually look at what is it that people are saying they actually really want, you're going to get outcompeted. So, you know, this is um, this is a very plausible future in, in is what you're saying for businesses and that they need to, for their own survival, they need to be taking this seriously and starting to build this into practices and strategies today um, because, you know, this is a, a direction that the economy might take due to a number of different forces beyond the business's own control. Um, and so it's, it's therefore a, as much a, a risk as it is um, an opportunity to gain or lose competitive advantage, I think is what I've taken from what you've said. Um, so businesses could basically, large businesses can be an agent for change to create an economy that's desirable for all. I think is how I would sum up um, what, I, what I've heard from you, from you both on this question. Um, could we perhaps turn now to what we think um, some of the large scale enterprises are that we would actually need in this post growth future because Donna you just reflected on the fact that businesses need to be producing what we need, so our economy needs to have organizations that we need, so do we have a need for large scale um, organizations uh, and which ones would they be perhaps. Um, Donna have you if I reflect that back to you first, what do you think. Well, the first thing I often say to people talking about that kind of future and what the market looks like is that, for me, it's not too dissimilar in some of the aspects. Um, there's a tendency, perhaps, among maybe leftists or people who would self-describe as leftists to either talk about, like, nationalizing certain industries or in libertarian sort of spaces to say, actually, we need everything to be community driven and we want to decentralize uh, things. And I think that both of those sort of miss an interesting dynamic here, which is that there are lots of large scale businesses that aren't for profit, for example, or aren't government corporations. And I'm thinking here of, of BRAC, uh, which we might touch on a little bit later, a billion dollar enterprise that does incredible work. If you're not familiar with BRAC, uh, we'll go into that a little bit later. But in terms of the kind of industries that these things are in, I imagine that most of the existing industries uh, outside of the kinds of things we might see in terms of defense uh, and the kind of spending we see in that area. But things like global communications, you still need centralized uh, repositories, even when it comes to things like energy usage. There's good research that shows that you need to support a decentralized um, network with a set with certain aspects of centralization. And I think that's sort of a, an underlying principle that's relevant here. And even to sort of say in our modeling, we found that there's even roles for things like large hedge fund um, industries. Why? Because if you're talking about a post-growth future and a situation where risk is ongoing, hedge funds in their purest form, not in the way that they've become extra, uh, extractive and abstracted uh, in terms of mathematical model and risk, et cetera, hedge funds actually play important pieces in an insurance setup to actually ensure that if you're uh, operating across international currencies that you can actually hedge to ensure that your business model is uh, reliable in terms of whether it's agricultural pro uh, agricultural produce, et cetera, et cetera. So just to sort of say, I think that there's a lot of similarities, but a different infrastructure, a different system economically where things are happening differently in terms of money, power, and resources. That's really interesting. I don't think a lot of people uh, in the post-growth world, as you've, as you've said, on the sort of leftist side, will be thinking about hedge funds. And I think it's really important to sort of raise some of these more, um, you know, um, sort of mathematical aspects, if you like, behind the economy that we still need some of these things. Um, Catherine, um, have you been thinking about this at all and, and where have you landed? I, I want to pick up on Donnie's use of the word hedge, hedge there too, as the, as the verb to, to hedge as well, because it really reminds me that, we, you know, the, the definition of resilience, which is a term I'm often really uncomfortable with, but, but in this context, you know, the definition of resilience is around if you've got diversity and slack. In a, in a system. And so often I was in the UK during COVID, you know, that's a, a, a an economy that had been pushed to sort of hyper efficiency, hyper specialization. And then when COVID hit, we saw the impacts of that because supply chains broke down and we didn't have, you know, the systems to take care of care of folk. And what I think this idea of you know hedging through having you know resilience in your system, I think probably is more easy in at, at scale. Um, you know, lots of incredible tiny companies and organizations that I've worked for too, by virtue of being small, it's really hard for them, say if someone has to take a 12 months off to have maternity leave and so on. But we should have organizations that are able to take care 
and provide for their their employees on on that basis so the idea of diversity and resilience i think that is enabled when you do get to a sort of critical mass of size is is really important i think the other point really probably it's my sort of summing up of what donnie's saying is around you know when scale makes sense you know not scale for its own sake by any means but when scale is necessary dependent on the sector or the circumstance or your know, geographic issue or needing that that diversity and i just want to share with you i think really helpful definition um, of the purpose of business because you know there's a lot of chat now around what's the, the purpose of business and it's a term that's rolled out a lot and you see a lot of companies just whack the term purpose on their on their websites but the British Academy have you know through a process of you know quite a lot of discussion and consultation came up with this I think really crisp elegant description they say the purpose of business is to solve the problems of people and planet profitably so profit being sort of the means rather than the end there so you know making it being financially viable um rather than profit being its own goal um but then not profit from causing those problems and i think that's a really quite and i guess we could apply that same sort of thinking to scale so it's you know when is scale useful um to solve the problems of people and planet not you know have scale just because of its own sake or you know we're having to roll out um things at scale to respond to the collateral damage of the the current system i also want to just sort of add i think this idea of you know scale by clusters is really really important there was a report that my colleagues at the wellbeing economy alliance scotland hub did a couple of years ago looking at the craft beer sector in Scotland so really a you know, growing sector in terms of more and more craft beer companies growing and what they discovered is that they are so awesome at sharing recipes sharing equipment sharing sustainable development technologies to make the craft brewing sector more sustainable lighter on the planet and they don't see themselves as competing with each other so in a way as a cluster they're building a scale there because they're you know they've got that commonality and that shared goal and they see themselves as competing against a sort of more establishment legacy brewing sector you know they want to inculcate a different way of thinking about beer they take care of their local community they have great local employment and we were talking to one of the brewers uh, an awesome guy, guy called Mark Hazel from Jaw Brew so if you're ever in Glasgow go and visit him and we were saying you know do you do you want to grow your business he said well if I had to if I got bigger I'd probably be stuck in the back office doing the accounts and away from the craft of making beer that I love and then he thought about it and he said well actually though if we got big enough that we could have our own bottling um, line on our premises maybe I'd want to get big enough to do that because if we had our own bottling line that would reduce our environmental impact because of transport and we could employ more local people so it's very much size for that goal not for its own sake and very wary of the their drawbacks of getting bigger too but I just think that idea of sort of that cluster that comes from you know shared business interests that say we want to compete against someone else collectively but share recipes and share technology is a really beautiful way of understanding different different way of doing scale so it's sort of scale together rather than scale on your own I, I absolutely love that um, British Academy um, um, definition of solving problems of people profitably, but not profiting from causing problems. That's um, something I'm definitely going to take away from this. And one of the sort of things that's leaping out at me is that um, there's a, there's an element of uh, businesses having a right size. There's a right size where they can um, meet those problems in the right way. Um, and we have a lot of probably um organizations in in the economy right now that are the wrong size so there will be a recalibration perhaps when we enter a post-growth um sort of dominant society and, and economy where there's there's going to be a changing of of the sizes of different organizations and different industries as well another um sort of large-scale um sort of type of business I was thinking of Donnie which was um, linking in with what you were saying was perhaps global logistics I think we're still going to have to move stuff around the world and there will be um, sort of efficiencies and sufficiencies if you like in using um, more sort of global logistics organizations and and those tapping into sort of smaller um, localized supply chains where they where they can um, <clears throat> so um, I think 
perhaps looking at the fact that in, in terms of right sizing businesses, uh, especially large businesses that already exist, there will be perhaps in the future some elements of contraction, some elements of decentralization, perhaps some fragmentation, quite a lot of disruption perhaps for larger businesses. And so they're going to have to be thinking about um, a post-growth future um, in, in quite complex ways and, and with a lot of consideration to some of the transition aspects. So in order to sort of set this up for larger businesses, they might want to see what success looks like and what the attributes of success might be in this future. So could we perhaps talk a little bit about that? Catherine, have you got any ideas there? Yeah, and I'll, I'll draw on a report that we all did a couple of years ago called the um, Guide for Business of Wellbeing Economy. So basically a, a business guide, and they distilled down seven dimensions that they think are really useful for businesses who want to be about contributing positively and be part of the future of an economic system that, that serves people and planet. And I'll just rattle through them really quickly because um, I don't have them up on I could pull up a slide, but I, I won't. But but you, you can get the document. Perhaps we can share it in, in the notes. Um, but it's things like, you know, what is the definition of, of success? You know, is it to draw on the British Academy definition, you know, to serve people and planet? Um, questions around ownership and governance. Is it concentrated or is it delegated to people most affected, including employees? or even lo local communities, even suppliers, even you know, future generations or nature, as we see with companies like Faith in, Faith in Nature. Uh, leadership and participation, again, you know, who drives the organisation? Is it one sort of individual or you know, small group of people or is it a collective decision making around you know, the direction of travel of the, the business and who's around that table, who has a voice in that? Uh, linked to that also is community and stakeholder relations. You know, are they extractive or are they very much about mutual benefit? And again, that comes back to power, you know, who has a right to, you know, say things and have their voice and their wishes taken seriously and adhered to. Uh, is innovation um, just about keeping the status quo going or maybe, you know, tending to negative impacts or is it about proactively thinking about positive, positive impact? Uh, in terms of measuring that that success that I talked about earlier, how, you know, how do we really go to go far in terms of translating a stated vision? Um, oh, thank you, Yashar. That's really great. Um, it, in terms of state, taking that state of vision and really accounting for it in our measures of success and what outcomes are considered. And finally, I think this is a really important one is around, you know, how is learning done? Uh, is, is failure a learning opportunity or is it something where, you know, people are terrified to fail and you get a whole lot of emperor's new clothes situations where people are not calling out something going wrong? And my goodness, I don't know if any of you have been watching the news in Australia of what's happening in the account, the big accounting consulting firm firms at the moment, PwC would be worth watching, where you see this culture of not being able to call out things that are not okay, whether they're dangerous or unethical or, you know, you know, hurting the, the planet and so you know is that is there a culture where failure can be used as a or as a learning opportunity to to improve and I, I just think they I've seen a lot of these sort of bullet points and lists I think those seven to me really have stood the test of time since the document were published and I think they cover a lot of the bases and they're sort of a good list to maybe have on the um the pin board or in the staff room or in you know around the on a placemat in the boardroom as, as companies are making decisions and really thinking through what they need to be doing to be part of this solution yeah I, I really like that list too and um some of the things that from my own background and degrowth that um I was reflecting on there was the fact that you're talking about relationships and this relationality with with a, with a wide group of stakeholders um, and this porosity of boundaries that the business is not a standalone entity, you know, there are relationships pouring across those boundaries all the time. And then, of course, that question of ethics, you know, why are they there? What are they there to do? Um, and making sure that it's a very good purpose. So, um, Donnie, of course, let me ask you now as well. What do you think are the most important attributes for success in this future? I'd like to build on two of the points that Catherine raised about ownership and, and power. Um, I remember sitting down at a conference maybe eight years ago with four of the senior leaders in sustainability at IKEA. Um, and for those who don't know, IKEA is a not-for-profit business. It's a foundation-owned business. It's been that way for many, many decades. Um, and it's an interesting case to explore on its own. But I sat down with these folks. They didn't know me. They didn't know my background. And I asked that I could just ask them a question without them knowing anything about me. And they agreed. 
And so I said, did you all work in for-profit companies before IKEA in sustainability? And they all said, we did. And I said, okay. When you look at your experience at IKEA versus those previous experiences, does the fact that IKEA is a not-for-profit entity change how your experience of sustainability is in that company? And they all immediately unanimously said, absolutely. When we unpacked it, it was, they, as, I, as you might expect, they said, because we don't have private shareholders in IKEA, we come as sustainability practitioners and we can talk about sustainability from the beginning without needing to start with how does this affect the bottom line. That difference, they said, was huge. That comes down to the ownership structure. You know, I'll be very interested to see what's happen what will happen with Patagonia now that it no longer has any private individual owners, right? That the owner gave up the $4 billion ownership stake and has now put it into trust. That may change the dynamics. It's not as much as it changes if you've got, you know, millions of absent shareholders, that's a much stronger pressure versus a benevolent kind of individual owner, but it will change things. Now that company is going to be owned in, stu in a stewardship model. So this ownership piece is, is big and the four models that I recommend people here that are listening and might be interested in like what does a model look like where money circulates rather than being extracted from uh, the real economy. Uh, the four different forms of not for profit uh, business that exists across cultures throughout the world most. There's the foundation owned model. There is the not for profit enterprise where a non profit has. Uh, the enterprises underneath it that either it uses to cross subsidize other activities or um, or actually achieves its outcomes with those activities themselves. There is consumer cooperatives uh, and there's government enterprises. All four forms of those business allow for the circulation of money back into the real economy, uh, excluding if you have very high income differentials within those nonprofits, which is very rare. The second piece around power is crucial too and so often trails the ownership setup. If I think of one of the world's uh, most popular not-for-profit organizations uh, that most people probably wouldn't realize, it's a consumer cooperative and it's Barcelona Football Club. Now, you may not be a supporter of Barcelona or you may be a supporter of Barca. And the interesting thing is that if you are a supporter of that organization, you can become a member. And hundreds of thousands of people every year as members of that football club, football club, go and vote on the board, on various proposals, etc. because it's a, yeah, well, if you're a Real, Real Madrid fan, good news, same model. It's a consumer cooperative. Now, if you're a United, Manchester United fan, sorry, that's a privately individually owned company. There's a difference there. And even if, you know, they're very much in the capitalistic system, paying massive salaries, trading people, et cetera. The fundamental difference around power is strong. It means that that club is for the people. Its purpose is to be for the people. So its decision-making is different. Just like the Green Bay Packers in the US um, NHL, uh, the N NFL, not for profit. There's no private individual owners of the Green Bay Packers compared to you know, uh, any one of the other teams. That is interesting that we've got these big companies that have resisted the private buyout. And even though they're not perfect, they speak to the future of that circulation where the power is circulating, where the decision making is circulating. And I think companies that are using and approaching things like holacracy or sociocracy, and we're now seeing uh, certain companies that have got thousands of employees engaging with flatter governance models that use consent rather than autocratic decision-making. That's powerful stuff because to Catherine's point earlier, the workforce is changing and people are starting to say in an interesting way, and this is, this is the most surprising thing I've seen over the last 15 years, since 2008, I've seen people saying, you know what? I'd actually rather live in a car than keep working in, what, in a way that feels like I'm actually giving up all of my integrity. That's something that the world's not seen ever before in the, the history of the modern market, where people are willing to take the trade off and say, I'm not doing it anymore. 
And I think that's in part because of the way that power has been concentrating and speaks to the flip side that if your company is actually thinking of seeding power and transitioning, you open up a really interesting avenue for engaging some incredible talent that was previously inaccessible. That's that's incredible. Um, I, you know, we speak in, in, in my studies about democratizing social metabolism, and I, and I think you're saying the same thing here, is that making those decisions about what we make, how we make it, who we make it for, those decisions have to be made by a, more of a community than this sort of elite structure we have at the moment. And I was listening to actually a, um, a conversation by um, Yanis Varoufakis, the, the sort of Greek politician economist, last week, and he was saying the same thing, that he used to work for an organization in which every employee had one vote and the majority of decisions they made in the organization were taken collaboratively by the, the employees. And he, he really um, rates that sort of way of approaching business. Um, so, yeah, and I love your um, examples of Barcelona and Green Bay Packers. I think that will really resonate with a lot of people and, and bring people in, and, which is important, give them an entry point into this conversation. So actually, they're great examples. Um, so we have uh, less than 10 minutes left, and I just want to move on to a final question, which I think might uh, um, cover some of the questions coming through in the chat in a sort of a generic way which is um, what are some of the key first steps that our business leaders can, can take to sort of activate these first um, forays into post-growth thinking? Catherine, can I bounce that back to you first? Thanks. Sure, just ever so quickly, because I'd love to get to the, the questions too. I mean, I do, I do think there is something about being honest about where we are today and the challenges facing humanity uh, and where they've come from and the the origin of them. And I, so I think a, an honest conversation is is really an vital first step. And I think that feeds into then your mindsets that then will enable the sort of conversations that are needed. So to, to me, it's sort of being honest, honest, and then you know, really thinking what is the, the role of business in being part of positive solutions, given the enormity of challenges face, we're facing today, and then enabling conversations broader than just maybe the traditional conversations that folks are used to having in, in big businesses. So bringing communities around the table, bringing your know, frontline workers around the table, bringing suppliers around the table, uh, bringing future generations around the table. Yeah. And, and again, faith in nature is a really good example, you know, that's put, you know, as a board position to represent nature. Uh, and so I think there's there's ways to to do it. Um, so just very briefly, they'd be, they'd be there to me, really critical first steps. Yeah, Tony, Tony, what do you think about this one? As a good friend, uh, Bayo says of his Yoruba traditions in Western Africa, the times are urgent, let's slow down. That's what I'd say, is, is slow down. If, if you look at those graphics at the beginning, it, it speaks to the point that everyone, pretty much everyone around the world, I mean, I've done that experiment with people probably across 200 countries, right? Almost everywhere in the world. And inherently, we all know that there's a different path needed. In other words, we're all just walking around with different levels of cognitive dissonance around that. So slowing down, recognizing that we have to get from the jagged line to the circle. We have to move from the linear to the nonlinear and that that's multidimensional slowing down to actually then explore what does that mean for my company if i want this company to have a legacy if i'm interested in employing people if i'm interested in providing those livelihoods if i'm interested in fulfilling that model that you you shared catherine of the uh, british um the british uh, society's definition then the reality is one needs to slow down and grapple with that internal dissonance and then see is my model that i'm involved in circulating money is it circulating power is it circulating resources and if it's not first steps can be to just delve into what would that look like explore that there's plenty of literature out there that's that's starting to emerge uh, but i feel like starting with a space of, of a deep recognition of what you're feeling is actually critical rather than keeping these conversations in our head because our feelings speaking to someone who mentioned indigenous wisdoms in the in the chat there Gosh, every Indigenous culture that I know that I've interacted with people from always start in their bodies, always start from a space of how's this feeling and then move into connecting that with what needs to be done. 
Thank you. Um, yeah, some really strong reflections there, which I think probably a lot of business leaders are not, as you said, there's cognitive distance everywhere, but I think a lot of business leaders are not used to thinking in these ways. So there is a lot of unlearning, a lot of new learning to be done, um, and a lot of uh, informing and inspiring to be done with people who are working in post-growth still to bring leaders to these conversations. Um, one of the things I sort of reflect on when I speak to corporates or, or anyone in the corporate world about this is that businesses need to be start, start thinking about having a position on post-growth, really sort of figuring out what their stance is and being prepared to speak about that in the media if they're asked, because I think businesses are going to be asked, what do you think about a post-growth future going forward? So they really need to start having something that they can actually answer to that question. We only have a few minutes left and there's um, one question in the chat that's caught my eye, which is from uh, Damien. Um, if I could just read it out to be quick, Damien, large organizations are inherently more captured by their own organizational structure, size and inertia. Do you think the struggle to enable um, um, transformational change in large organizations is in many ways inhibited by their size and success? Do they need to start failing to change? I think that's, um, do we need that shock tactic of uh, businesses failing before we'll see change in this space? We have a couple of minutes left. Donnie, very quickly, what do you think? 100%. It's going to happen. It's already happening. If you see the latest data on banks in the US, uh, thousands of them are actually already technically bankrupt. It's important not to beat around the bushes here because we feel this in our bodies too. There's collapse coming in, in ways that we've not seen before across market economies. Not 2008, not COVID, but situations where significant swathes of large businesses are going to fail and they're going to be the situation previously has been too big to fail now we're going to move into a situation where it's too big of a problem for it to not fail we can't prop up this idea that you know a capitalistic free market so supposedly free market actually works and you'll actually see an ideological split where it's going to be too big not to fail and uh, so absolutely i think we need to see that signal and then at the same time where a lot of groups are putting their attention is on the, what's changing in the MBA programs, in the general business programs, in the startup space, where we're seeing so much interest in social entrepreneurship, including not-for-profit forms of, of that, Melanie Rybeck's work in post-growth entrepreneurship, et cetera. These things can happen simultaneously so that new class of agile, lean businesses that are democratically led and democratically owned come through as these old behemoths crash under the weight of unbearable debt. Awesome. Awesome answer. Can, can I, I just want to add, because I agree, agree with everything Donnie said, but also to really Damien's point around the sort of extent of the capture by corporate size and the challenges that this um, makes on this transition. And I don't think we should be you know, naive. This is a simple flick of the light switch and that you know these massive businesses will automatically become incredible, beautiful, um, generate, regenerative, distributive organisations. But it just because it's hard and those governance systems are so entrenched doesn't mean it it can't happen. And I'm I'm hearing people in the ESG world, you know, really wanting to not just go beyond quarters in their measurement, but actually go beyond financial returns, which could be a game changer. I mean, that that's an extraordinary conversation. I mean, it's tiny and at the margins in that in that sector, but it's they're the sort of conversations we need. And we do see the possibility of you know businesses transferring large scale businesses to employee ownership. So Richard Sounds in the UK is an example of that, Eileen Fisher in the US and others. So it, it's it's I want to just really acknowledge Damon's point around the the you know the the structures and internal architecture and ways of thinking and habits and heuristics and, and you know mindsets that that they, those sort of structures inculcate and perpetuate and, and again I mentioned PwC earlier that's an example of, of that but it doesn't mean it's impossible um, so it's going to be hard but but there are examples of organizations that can do it. Awesome thank you great answers to all those questions thank you so much we've run out of time now um, um, I hope that's given everybody some great food for thought um, it certainly has for me so awesome everyone thank you over to you Pete and Stephen. Kira, Jennifer, uh, Catherine and Donnie, thank you so much for such a powerful, deep and thought-provoking um, conversation. Um, it really brought about a lot of uh, thoughts for myself between my ex-anarchist kind of like uh, self and now my role supporting uh, young entrepreneurs. And, and what I am pleased to, 
see there is um, now the majority of our young entrepreneurs being purpose driven, but really, really this need for um, this transformative change. So. Um...